Test one, two, test one, two, three, four. Test one, two, test one, two. Test one, two, three, four, five. We switched out. Okay. Still sounds awful and really low. That's what Charlie said. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Test one, two, 22, 37. Test one, two, hold on. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. That was good. Check. That Mic good. check, one, two. Mic check, one, two, one, two. One, two, one, two. Mic check, one, two. Mic check, mic check. Test one, two, 22, 37. 22, 37, test one, two. Do you hear me, Kelly? Clear for the moment, clear. Now, now it's bad again. Okay. Now it's bad again. Okay, that's great. Test one, two, test one, two, three, four, five. Bad, I know. I can hear it. Test one, two, test one, two, twenty-two, thirty-seven. Test one, two, three, four. Test one, two, three, four. Test one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, twenty-two. Test one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, twenty-two. Yes, um, what Daryl's asking something. Can you, can you hear? Test one, two, tell me, Kelly, what does it sound like, please? Test one, two, twenty-two, thirty. 2236. No, what? What does that mean? No. You'll be clear and then it's terrible. Test. Banyan's going to talk. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Mic check. 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 One, two. One, two. Mic check. One, two. Mic check one two. Mic check one two. Check one. Check one two. One two. One two. Mic check one two. Mic check one two. Mic check one two. Mic check one two. One two. Mic check. Mic check one two. Mic check one two. Mic check one two. Mic check one two. One two. Mic check. Mic check. One two. One two. Mic check one two. One two. Mic check one two. It's clear now, Daryl. One two. One two. Mic check one two. One two. Mic check one two. One two. Mic check one two. Mic check one two. One two. Mic check, one two, one two. Mic check, one two, one two. Mic check. Mic check, one two. Mic check, one two, one two, one two. Chairman's mic test one two three four. Chairman's mic, what? What do you? Chair. All in a mix. Witness three. Mic check one two. Witness three. Mic check one two. One two one two. Mic check one two. One two one two.
Mic check, one, two, one, two, one, two. Mic check, one, two, one, two. Mic check, one, two. Witness four, mic check, one, two. Chair Mike 2237, check 1234. Chair Mike 2237, check 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. Chair Mike Bag, test one.
the subcommittee on the constitution and civil justice will come to order without objection the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time we welcome everyone to today's hearing on the first amendment protections on public college and university campuses and i now recognize myself for my opening statement fears of government overreach in our nation's founding era necessitated the inclusion of explicit protections of liberty in the United States Constitution. Among them includes provisions to protect speech. Indeed, the First Amendment states that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of the speech or of the press or of the right of the people to peaceably, uh, of rather people peaceably to assemble. The Supreme Court has long held that the First Amendment applies to states and government entities, including public colleges and universities. While the First Amendment prohibits public colleges and universities from restricting free speech, it generally does not apply to private institutions because the First Amendment regulates only government conduct. And while, and while acceptance of federal funding confers some obligations on private colleges, such as compliance with federal anti-discrimination laws, compliance with the First Amendment is not among these obligations. Today, our institutions of high learning have too often turned from being a marketplace of ideas to a dictatorship of ideas. Students, for example, no longer feel comfortable expressing ideas. According to a 2015 national survey released by Yale University's William F. Buckley Jr. program, 49% of students surveyed often, quote, felt intimidated to share their ideas, opinions, or beliefs in class because they were different than their professors and course instructors, close quote. According to the same survey, half of the students surveyed often, quote, felt intimidated to share their ideas, opinions, or beliefs in class because they were different than their classmates or peers, close quote. This is in part due to the administrative policies maintained by the institutions. These administrative policies, known as speech codes, are defined by the Foundation for Institutional Rights in Education, known as FIRE, F-I-R-E. This way, defined this way, quote, any campus regulation that punishes, forbids, heavily regulates, or restricts a substantial amount of protected speech, close quote. They come in a variety of forms, including restricting free speech to designated areas on campus called free speech zones, or banning offensive communication altogether. Not all what our founding fathers had in mind. Time and time again, courts have struck down these administrative policies. Nevertheless, we continue to hear that students are being prevented from engaging in all manner of expression. For example, Alliance Defending Freedom filed a lawsuit earlier this year regarding the arrest, the arrest by campus police of a student and of Young Americans for Liberty supporters who were passing out copies of the Constitution on the sidewalk of Kellogg Community College in Battle Creek, Michigan. Last week, FIRE warned student newspapers about printing satire on April Fool's Day. The warning stated in part, disturbingly, colleges have indeed launched full-fledged investigations into newspapers following satirical, editori ed satirical editions, threatening the publications with loss of funding and future oversight by content review boards. Staff members have been subjected to sensitivity training, editors have been fired, newspapers themselves confiscated." Close quote. A police state is what that sounds like to me, not the United States of America. And I happen to remember standing outside of Charlie Hebdo in Paris some months ago. I went there to witness the location of what it would be like when they come in with a speech code and slaughtered, I believe, 12 people in that place for their satire. In America, we stand up against that. These examples in the hundreds, if not thousands, of stories that continue to arise reflect a dangerous trend. It was observed in the founding era by Benjamin Franklin, who was himself a great satirist, that without freedom of thought, there can be no such thing as wisdom and no such thing as public liberty without freedom of speech." Close quote. It is therefore clear that we seek to maintain our form of government. To do so, we must uphold its fundamental principles. I think of some other circumstances, and I mentioned, I mentioned what happened in Paris. 
But I'm also thinking of sitting down with a young lady named Elizabeth Wolf in Vienna some couple of years ago who was on her last appeal and on her way to the European court because she had, she had been convicted of hate speech <coughs> through the Austrian legal system before and, and all the way up appealed to the Euro European court for this, for asking the rhetorical question, if you have sexual relations with a nine-year-old, does that make you a pedophile? That was politically incorrect, and she faced that criticism. I think very recently of the second most popular politician in the Netherlands, Mr. Geert Wilders, who was convicted of hate speech uh, by a courts in his own country that he nearly became the prime minister of. We don't want to see that in this country, but what the motive is, I think, is captured here. Uh, first, I would point out uh, Charles Murray has been booed and hissed and some violence on campus and driven off campus because they didn't like the ideas that they thought he might speak to or they didn't like what he had written 20-some years ago. But I think it was captured to a degree by George Orwell in his book 1984. He said, he wrote, we're not interested in, in the overt act. It is the thought that we care about. And the, th the thought of that is, if you can control th the words, you can control the thoughts. If you can control the thoughts, you can control the action. So this anti-hate speech thing and this suppression of our First Amendment liberties and this God-given First Amendment liberties in this country are being suppressed by political correctness, are being suppressed on the campuses uh, across this land. And it's not just suppressing our freedom of speech. What it's doing is suppressing our freedom of thought. And a nation that doesn't have freedom of thought cannot cure its problems. That's why we have freedom of speech. So um, I would uh, yield back the balance of my time and recognize a ranking member from Tennessee for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I can't and won't just get into a pros and cons of, on this issue. There are both pros and cons. We're all for free speech, and we all understand, though, I think that there are some limits to it. Uh, fire in a theater and uh, speech may be where you incite people to gross people out of a political arena uh, where there are limits and you cause violence or you threaten people. And uh, so there are, there are limits, but then we have respect for free speech. My concern is while this is important, and no question it's an important issue, that the real important issues facing this country at this time is the First Amendment is freedom of the press. And there are attacks on the press on a regular basis today, which I think this subcommittee needs to look into. It was Richard Nixon who first thought that the press was the enemy, the enemy of the people uh, in modern history. Uh, before that, it was Stalin. That was modern, too. But it wasn't American. It was before the Russian-American melding uh, took place. And um, uh, what we've seen here is the beginnings of fascism in some ways. And part of what you see with fascism um, disdain for the press, uh, controlling mass media. There are other signs that we see that are scary. That's part of it. The freedom of the press is so important to being a check and balance on government and to government that is uh, uncontrolled. That is overarching the issue that we face today concerning the First Amendment is the freedom of the press, not necessarily this particular limited freedom of speech, which is oftentimes on campuses and oftentimes invective that is hurled at sexual orientation minorities and or people of minority religions, whether Jews or Muslims, uh, gays, transgendered, etc. And there are some reasons to s limit that speech because sometimes it turns to violence and um, that's another problem that we have seeing that we have as um, one of the signs of fascism as exhibited at the Holocaust Museum is identification of enemies as a unifying cause. And some of this is, is what happens there, and we're seeing it today. Uh, I also must mention today is the anniversary of Dr. King's assassination in Memphis 49 years ago. 
It's also the 50th anniversary of a speech at Riverside Church, which is the most powerful speech I think that I know uh, in my lifetime, it reflecting on the three militarisms, militarism, materialism, and racism that still are the enemies of this nation and mankind, which we haven't been able to deal with in an appropriate way. And that uh, Dr. King wasn't allowed to speak in Memphis, wasn't allowed to march in Memphis, and that's part of speech, is the ability to protest and to march. And the city didn't want him to protest. They had to, go, Mr. Lucius Birch had to go to court to, to, to get the federal court to allow him to march. And that's why he came to Memphis for, for people's rights and workers' rights, which weren't being respected. Uh, unfortunately, that's where he was uh, assassinated. So freedom of speech is important. We have come a long way with it. I understand, Mr. King, you're having this hearing, and I will submit into the record my wonderful remarks that were prepared on this subject that are just outstanding, but weren't the remarks I wanted to deliver today because I thought with this anniversary of the speech and the assassination, it was important to reflect on Dr. King, but so much more important to reflect on the press and the limits that we've got in this country right now uh, and the ability to the attempt to paint the press as enemies and fake news and to discredit the truth. There's, you can have freedom of the press, but when you've got powerful people in your country claiming that the press is not to be believed and is putting out fake news, um, that's a problem. And the First Amendment didn't envision it. Our founding fathers, who we talk about being reverently and how brilliant they were, even though they didn't understand slavery was wrong and didn't understand, or if they did, they didn't have the guts to put it in the Constitution, and they didn't understand the fact that women should have a right to vote and to full participation and people without uh, property should have that right. Uh, they didn't anticipate uh, a, an executive who talked about fake news and who parroted remarks without uh, any professional or expert uh, consultation uh, that sometimes came straight from Russian television. So I would ask the chairman to try to look into having a freedom of the press uh, First Amendment hearing because that's what faces this country right now and is most urgent. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman returns his time and uh, his unanimous request to introduce his statement into the record is uh, hearing no objections so ordered along with uh, before I recognize the ranking member, or the, the full chairman uh, of the committee, I would ask also unanimous consent to introduce into the record um, their, uh, dot statements from the uh, American Legislative Exchange Council, the Alliance for Defending Freedom, and uh, also these two newspaper articles that have referenced, that I referenced in my opening statement on Mr. Charles Murray. Hearing no objection, so ordered. I now recognize the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Goodlatte, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, on August 14, 2015, this committee sent a letter to 160 public colleges and universities that had received a red light rating from the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, FIRE. According to FIRE, a red light institution is one that has at least one policy that both clearly and substantially restricts freedom of speech. FIRE defines a clear restriction as a policy that on its face is a threat to free speech and does not depend on how the policy is applied. FIRE defines a substantial restriction as a policy that is broadly applicable to speech on campus. Given the positive responses to this letter by many colleges and universities and the increased attention to this issue, we've seen a substantial decrease in unconstitutional policies across the country in the last two years. FIRE reported last year that only 45.8% of the public schools surveyed received a red light rating. This year, the number has dropped to 33.9%. My hope is that the number will soon reach zero. Policies that limit free speech limit the expression of ideas. And no one, no one can be confident in their own ideas unless those <coughs> ideas are constantly tested through exposure to the widest variety of opposing arguments. This is especially crucial in a democracy. Founders of our country understood this clearly. George Washington and Thomas Jefferson wrote of the <coughs> importance of knowledge in a democracy. Washington wrote, knowledge is in every country the surest basis of public happiness. In proportion as the structure of a government gives force to public opinion, it is essential that public opinion should be enlightened. 
And as Thomas Jefferson reminded us, knowledge is power. If a nation expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization, it expects what never was and never will be. James Madison wrote of the inherent connection between learning and liberty, writing, and I quote, what spectacle can be more edifying or more seasonable than that of liberty and learning, each leaning on the other for their mutual and surest support? A popular government without popular information or the means of acquiring it is but a prologue to a farce or a tragedy or perhaps both. The people who mean to be their own governors must arm themselves with the power which knowledge gives. John Adams wrote specifically of the young that, it should be your care, therefore, and mine to elevate the minds of our children and exalt their courage. If we suffer their minds to grovel and creep in infancy, they will grovel all their lives. Mm. I thank Chairman King for holding this hearing, and I thank our witnesses for coming today. I look forward to your testimony and your ideas about how we can continue to foster the free expression of ideas on college campuses. Gentleman for Virginia has returned his time, and the chair would now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Conyers, for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman King. I, I'm happy to welcome the witnesses. I'm going to uh, yield to Jamie Waskin of Maryland in, as soon as I make these two sentences. While I don't pretend that we can fully resolve long-standing debate over hate speech and the First Amendment on public campuses during the course of this hearing. And while I acknowledge some tension between free spe speech and equality interests, I hope we can have a productive discussion about the proper balance between protecting free speech and ensuring equal education opportunities for all students. So I'll be looking forward to the discussion that will follow. And I yield to the distinguished gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Raskin. Mr. Conyers, thank you very much uh, for your, uh, your courtesy and your kindness, as I have another meeting I'm going to have to get to in a moment. Uh, delighted to be here um, at this very interesting panel with uh, such great witnesses. Um, I, I suppose I should start by remarking that um, it's, uh, it's very easy for the left to denounce right-wing political correctness on campus, and it's very easy for the right to denounce left-wing political correctness on campus. Um, the issue is whether all of us can stand up for all free speech, including the speech we disagree with. The, you know, I used to tell my students that free speech is like an apple, and everybody wants to just take one bite out of it. I, I'm okay with free speech except for sexist speech, except for racist speech, except for extreme left-wing speech, except for extreme right-wing speech. Pretty soon, everybody's taking a bite and there's nothing left to the apple. So we've got to accept the whole apple if we want to have free speech for real in the country. Now, um, there are certain things that I imagine that would unify everybody on the panel and everybody uh, on, on this side of the, the panel as well, which is, um, free speech zones are anathema. In America, under the First Amendment, the whole campus is a free speech zone. And to the extent that you depart from free speech, that should be the exception and not the rule. So campuses that uh, rope off a little area on the other side of the soccer fields and say that's the area where you can exercise your free speech um, are really in violation of the First Amendment, and I think we should all be able to agree to that. Um, it gets more complicated, of course, when you get into the, the question of what goes on in the classroom, what goes on with people's scholarship and so on. And I think we need a little bit of historical context, which I would be happy to have some of the witnesses elaborate on. It seems clear to me when you look at it historically that most of the speech suppression that um, we saw in the 1950s and 60s and 70s was of a conservative or right-wing nature against left-wing political speech. In the 1950s, of course, it was McCarthyism, and there were lots of professors who lost their jobs because they didn't conform to the standard academic or intellectual dogmas of the time. Uh, William F. Buckley's book, God and Man at Yale, was an important moment in the history of uh, orthodox political correctness on campus. In that book, which I recommend to anybody who hasn't read it, um, Buckley comes out very strongly for indoctrination 
on campus in Christianity, in individualism, and attacks views uh, that he views as dissenting from that and saying that they don't belong on campus. Um, in the 1960s and 70s, of course, there were tens of thousands of uh, anti-war protesters, civil rights protesters who were suspended or expelled or otherwise driven off campus um, for their views or perhaps their views uh, interlaced with different actions that they took in terms of sit-in protests or whatever, whatever it might be. Today, it's not right-wing political correctness that's seen as a big threat on campus. We hear a lot more about left-wing um, political correctness and uh, of course, we haven't seen anything like the mass expulsions, suspensions, firings that took place in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, but undoubtedly there seems to be a rise in kind of puritanical language protocols that are enforced in the classroom or on campus. People are made to feel uncomfortable if they arrive at campus not knowing the correct gender pronouns to use in this case or that. And, you know, th they're all of that I think is problematic, but we need to put it in the overall historical <coughs> context of what really has gone on. Um, so just a, a couple of points that I would welcome any reaction to. One is about booing and heckling, um, which uh, Mr. King mentioned, and I, I think I agree with his point about this. Booing and heckling is a, is a venerated American art. If you go back and read the transcripts of the Lincoln-Douglas debates, there was lots of heckling that took place, but it was a kind of interjection, and then there would be an answer from the speaker, and that was all right. But the booing and heckling that drowns somebody out is just stupid and is, I think, outside of our free speech tradition and should not be considered to be part of the general First Amendment norm. Um, the basic rule in the academic context was set forth by the Supreme Court in Hazelwood versus Kuhlmeyer, which said students have the free speech right to wear a black armband, as Mary Beth Tinker did in protest of the Vietnam War, um, or to speak out, as long as they're not materially interrupting the educational mission, making it impossible for other people to learn. And I think that's the most critical point here. Um, obviously, kids have got to learn to accept other people having a point of view that's antithetical to their own. That's part of what it means to live in a liberal society. Um, at the same time, we don't want face-to-face -face vilification and harassment of people such that you really do create an adverse, hostile learning environment. And I think that's the difficult line to draw and that we would welcome the, the views of the committee um, about that. And then finally, as to the question of academic freedom, it seems to me that, that professors and teachers um, should have a, a First Amendment right to take the views that they want, to have the positions that they want. On the other hand, the schools and the universities do have the power through the tenure process to decide whether someone is actually progressing and succeeding according to the rigorous academic standards in a particular field. So if somebody on their own time, for example, wants to, you know, take, say, deny that the Holocaust happened, but they're a professor of mathematics and it's got nothing to do with their academic teaching, that's obviously okay. If their, their whole academic project is to show that the Holocaust didn't happen and it's found not to live up to the rigors um, and the, the standards of uh, academic success in that field, I think it's perfectly fine to say that person doesn't get tenure. And so I think that's another line that we need to draw that is the right for people to have their private political views, but not to say just because I take some extremist stance that somehow that qualifies me to tenure. Somebody can deny the existence of climate change off campus, again, if they're a professor of history, but if they're in a scientific field and they think that just by denying the existence of climate change, they should get tenure, that strikes me as wrong unless they're actually able to adduce you know, the, the scientific evidence that would lead to that conclusion. I yield back and thank you very much. I yield back, time has expired. Two minutes and 54 seconds ago, let the record reflect that Chair <laughs> resisted his temptation to limit the gentleman's freedom of speech. Forgive me. <laughs> and uh, now, uh, with, without objection, other members' opening statements will be made a part of the record. And let me now introduce our witnesses. Our first witness is uh, Mr. Stanley Kurtz, a senior fellow at Ethics and Public Policy Center. And our second is Mr. Greg Lukanoff, who is the president and CEO of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, FIRE. And our third witness is Mr. David Hudson. Uh, he's an ombudsman for the, for the Newseum Institute's First Amendment Center, 
And our fourth witness is Ken Klukowski, a senior counsel and the director of strategic affairs at the First Liberty Institute. Excellent credentials all gentlemen, and I would ask each of the witnesses written statements will be entered into the record in their entirety, and I ask you to summarize your statements in five minutes uh, or less, and uh, hopefully you can stay within that time frame. There's a light in front of you that I think you're all familiar with by now. And uh, before I recognize the witnesses, we ask that um, you stand and be sworn in. Stand and raise your, your right hand, please. Gentlemen, do you swear that the testimony you're about to give before this committee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? But uh, you may be seated. Thank you, and let the record reflect that all the witnesses responded in the affirmative. And so I now recognize our, our first witness, Mr. Kurtz, uh, for your testimony. Mr. Kurtz. Could you turn on your microphone, please? Okay. How is it possible that the con uh, condition of free speech on our college campuses should be so precarious despite broad public support for the First Amendment? I believe that a critically important part of the answer to this question lies in the failure of administrators to discipline students who silence or disrupt visiting speakers or their fellow students. However problematic safe spaces and trigger warnings may be, however important it is to overturn campus speech codes and so-called free speech zones, so long as students are permitted to silence the speech of visiting speakers or their fellow students without disciplinary consequences, the growing threat to campus free speech will never be overcome. The destructive effects of speaker shoutdowns, meeting takeovers, or acts like the destruction of a run of conservative student newspapers go far beyond their statistical occurrence. A university may host numerous visiting speakers who conform to campus orthodoxies without incident. Yet even a single case in which a visiting speaker who clashes with campus orthodoxies is shouted down sends a powerful signal to students and faculty who would also challenge those orth orthodoxies to keep silent. Each silencing incident, moreover, makes it far less likely that speakers who depart from campus orthodoxies will be invited in the first place or will accept an invitation when offered. Each act of silencing that escapes discipline also encourages students to believe that they can continue to attack and disrupt the speech of others. In short, the failure to discipline direct attacks on the free expression of others creates a kind of low-grade anarchy on campus, a world in which intimidation rules and violence can never be far behind. All of this means that there is no substitute for well-enforced policies of administrative discipline for incidents in which protesters go beyond legitimate bounds and silence the expression of others. Sadly, however, administrators in our day are extremely reluctant to impose discipline on students who interfere with the free speech rights of others. Despite the fact that public colleges and universities are obligated to protect the First Amendment rights of their students, administrators all too often fail to enforce those rights. This means that freedom of speech will never be secure at our public colleges and universities until counter pressures are brought to bear upon administrators who remain reluctant to discipline those who violate the free speech rights of others. The key potential sources of such counter pressures are public scrutiny, university system boards of trustees, state legislatures, and the federal Congress. Along with James Manley and Jonathan Butcher of Arizona's Goldwater Institute, I recently co-authored a report that offers and explains model state-level legislation designed to protect First Amendment speech rights on America's public college and university campuses. That report is published by the Goldwater Institute. Although there are several legislative proposals in various states designed to restore and protect campus free speech, only the Goldwater proposal systematically addresses the central problem of discipline for those who interfere with the expressive rights of others. While the Goldwater proposal offers the best legislative solution at the state level, there is much that Congress could do 
to safeguard freedom of speech on America's campuses. I've outlined a possible federal approach to campus free speech in some detail in a piece entitled Federal Funding and Campus Free Speech, a Proposal. For example, Congress has the option of requiring public colleges and universities, and even private secular colleges and universities, potentially, seeking to qualify for federal student loans under Title IV of the Higher Education Act to file a pledge with the Department of Education to uphold student speech and association rights. So, for example, colleges wishing to qualify for student aid could be required to agree to establish, maintain, and utilize a system of sanctions to discipline students who interfere with the expressive rights of others. My written testimony explains both these state level and federal legislative plans in greater detail. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kurtz. Uh, Mr. Lukanoff. Chairman King, Vice Chairman DeSantis, Ranking Member Cohen, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, my organization, FIRE, was founded in 1999 to defend free speech, academic freedom, and due process on America's college campuses. FIRE is a principled, nonpartisan nonprofit, and this is reflected in both our staff and the cases we take. For example, our litigation has recently defended the right of students to protest animal cruelty and advocate for pot legalization, Second Amendment rights, and more. Just last week, we filed a lawsuit against Pierce College in California, which told a student that if he wanted to engage in free speech activities, he had to limit himself to a tiny free speech zone. The zone comprised only 0.003% of the campus. Put another way, if Pierce College were the size of a tennis court, free speech would be restricted to an area the size of a cell phone. Since our founding, FIRE has fought free speech zones, efforts by administrators to quarantine freedom of speech to tiny areas, and we've defeated many of them, including Texas Tech's infamous free speech gazebo, the University of Hawaii at Hilo's free speech swamp, and this sad little one at Blinn College in Texas, which was divided into even smaller halves by a bulletin board. Many institutions even required advanced permission for students to speak inside the zones. For example, the University of Cincinnati asked for 10 working days notice. Other speech codes comprise broad and vague restrictions on expression that practically anyone would be found guilty of violating. Take the University of West Alabama's prohibition on harsh text messages or emails, which is in force currently, or both the University of Connecticut and Drexel University's now defunct prohibitions on quote unquote inappropriately directed laughter. While many speech codes are absurd, fighting them, even at colleges bound by the First Amendment, has required more than 60 lawsuits since 1989, and all of the 56 suits that have concluded have resulted in either a speech protective court decision or the repeal of the speech code. The money and time public campuses waste defending these manifestly unconstitutional codes is a national scandal. Campuses should not be forced to respect students' First Amendment rights. But there is good news. Since I last spoke with the committee in 2015, and thanks in no small part to a letter uh, sent by Chairman Goodlot to 160 colleges and universities across the country, the number of speech codes on campus has decreased significantly. FIRE uses a simple red, yellow, and green traffic light system to rate colleges' written policies on expression. When we first published our findings in 2007, 75% of colleges maintain red light or laughably unconstitutional speech codes. In 2015, after years of fighting both inside and outside court, the percentage of red light codes had dropped to around 55%. And since Chairman Goodlatte's letter was sent, that number has now dropped to around to below 35%. At the same time, the number of green light schools, colleges whose codes do not threaten protected speech, has nearly doubled. While there is no need to be fatalistic about speech codes, much work still has to be done particularly as the Department of Education has championed a definition of sexual harassment that is so vague and broad that it seriously threatens campus speech. The Department of Education hailed this as a blueprint for all universities to follow, but it specifically eliminated the requirement that speech be both subjectively and objectively offensive, and it also reduced the definition of harassment to simply any unwelcome verbal conduct, also known as speech, of a sexual nature. To give you an idea of how broad such a code is, pr pr Professor Teresa Buchanan was fired from her job at Louisiana State University for violating a policy just like the blueprint, allegedly because she explained in realistic detail the way some parents talk to some teachers. 
She is currently suing Louisiana State University with FIRE's help, and we believe that any judge looking at the Department of Education's blueprint definition of harassment would have to find it glaringly unconstitutional. The House Judiciary Committee has already been a great ally in the fight for free speech on campus. Even in these polarized times, we hope that free speech on campus can be an issue that unites all parties. In my written testimony, I recommend uh, four additional approaches. Warn public campuses in each state that speech codes are unconstitutional and can unnecessarily cost the state money. Support the CAFE Act to put uh, a legislative end to free speech zones. Uh, uh, codify the Supreme Court's definition of student on student harassment set forth in Davis v. Monroe uh, County Board of Education, which I think would address Mr. Uh, Conyers' concerns, uh, Congressman Conyers' concerns. Um, and pass a federal New Voices Act to protect student uh, journalists, which should uh, please Representative uh, Cohen. So thank you so much for your time. The, the gentleman uh, returns his time and appreciate his testimony. The chair would now recognize Mr. Hudson for his testimony. Mr. Hudson. Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the subcommittee, it's a great honor to speak to you about First Amendment protections on public university and college campuses. I first want to discuss four animating principles of First Amendment jurisprudence that should govern any consideration of free speech issues. I then want to discuss the four issues that I've covered in my written testimony. The first animating principle is the marketplace of ideas. Back in 1919, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, in his great dissent in Abrams versus United States, wrote that, but when time has upset many fighting face, men have come to realize and believe in the very foundations of their own conduct that the ultimate good desired is better reached through free trade of ideas, that the best test of truth is the power of the thought to get itself accepted into the competition of the market. The United States Supreme Court in Caetian versus Board of Regents in 1967 ruled that the classroom was peculiarly the quintessential marketplace of ideas. Any principles or legislation must consider the fact that public universities must maintain a commitment to the marketplace of ideas. I realize that critical race theorists and others question the marketplace of ideas, saying that there is not equal access to the market. And while this may be true in some circumstances, where can we have a true marketplace of ideas but at a public university campus? We must deal with competing viewpoints. The second animating principle is the counter-speech doctrine. It was authored by Justice Louis Brandeis in his concurring opinion in Whitney v. California in 1927. If there be time to expose through discussion the falsehood and fallacies, to avert the evil by the processes of education, the remedy to be applied is more speech, not enforced silence. We must counter negative, harmful speech with positive speech. Public university officials must take an approach where they do not silence offensive, controversial speakers. We allow people to protest peacefully, but not engage in substantial disruption. The third animating principle is content discrimination and viewpoint discrimination. I like to tell my students, my First Amendment students from the National School of Law and my alma mater, Vanderbilt Law School, about the famous quote from Justice Thurgood Marshall. He wrote in 1972, but above all else, the First Amendment means that the government may not restrict speech because of its message, its ideas, its subject matter, or its content. Justice Antonin Scalia wrote that content-based restrictions on speech are presumptively unconstitutional. And Anthony Kennedy said that viewpoint discrimination is an egregious form of content discrimination. When public university officials allow some groups to distribute literature and not allow other groups, that can be content discrimination, and even worse, it can be viewpoint discrimination. The fourth animating principle is that we in this society must protect speech that we don't like. Chief Justice John G. Roberts, Jr. said, Speech is powerful. It can stir people to action, bring them both tears of joy and sorrow, and inflict great pain. 
the First Amendment requires that we do not punish the speaker for inflicting pain. As a nation, we have chosen a different course, that is to protect even hurtful speech on public issues so as not to stifle public debate. The four issues that I cover in my written testimony, one, we need to be very careful about allowing the infiltration of legal standards from K through 12 decisions that negatively impact college and university employees, professors, and students. The standard from Hazelwood that Representative Raskin mentioned, reasonably related to legitimate pedagogical concerns, is breathtakingly broad. We're seeing this now in the censorship of public officials and public school students who engage in online speech. The second principle I deal with is Garcetti versus Ceballos, 547 U.S. 410. On page 421, the U.S. Supreme Court wrote, when public employees make statements pursuant to their official job duties, they have no First Amendment protection. Thank you very much. The gentleman's time has expired, and I appreciate his testimony, and now recognize Mr. Klukowski for your testimony. Mr. Klukowski. Thank you. Thank, you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. The framers considered the Constitution's First Amendment necessary to enlighten self-government. The oxygen by which citizens can be informed to think through the issues of the day and hold accountable those in power. Public universities are state actors bound by the free speech clause. Because free speech is a fundamental right, government restrictions on content are subject to strict scrutiny, where government must show the restriction narrowly tailored to achieve a compelling interest. But often, we see viewpoint discrimination. For example, saying you cannot discuss abortion is content, but saying you can say pro-choice comments but not pro-life, that's viewpoint. The, it, we at First Liberty Institute have had to deal with this issue. For example, Audrey Jarvis was a 19-year-old student at Sonoma State University in 2013 and a devout Catholic. She was working for the Associated Student Production Organization at a student fair. During that event, her supervisor instructed her to remove the cross necklace that she was wearing because it might offend others. Also in 2013, Ryan Rotella's professor uh, at a communications class in Florida Atlantic University instructed the students to write the name Jesus on a piece of paper, put it on the ground, and stomp on it. Ryan is a devout Christian who was not comfortable stepping on his Savior's name. He was suspended from the class. Purdue University accepted a financial gift from a family who asked them to choose words for a plaque at the engineering school. When they chose seeking to better the world through understanding God's physical laws, Purdue called it an unconstitutional endorsement of religion, even though the Supreme Court in 2014 rejected this endorsement concept as a faulty misinterpretation of the Constitution's First Amendment. The reality is that viewpoint discrimination from private speakers in protected speech categorically violates the First Amendment. This is true in all forms of public forum, the doctrine governing which is discussed in my written testimony. More places on college campuses, most, are either traditional, designated, or limited public forum where students enjoy broad free speech protections. And First Liberty Institute is the largest law firm in the U.S. exclusively dedicated to protecting religious liberty for all Americans, represents all of these students and donors entirely free of charge. We also represent students in public grade schools dealing with similar issues. All these infringements on speech are unconstitutional. While First Liberty prevailed in all those cases, hostility is increasing against certain viewpoints and beliefs on campuses. A university is supposed to facilitate the free exchange of ideas to advance our understanding of the world. Students are better off when they're exposed to ideas or viewpoints they do not share. And learning to respect speakers with whom a student disagrees is vitally important to advancing a diverse and tolerant culture. And the First Amendment commands public universities to respect these principles. Yet now we see a culture of free speech zones, islands surrounded by an ocean of university facilities and locations where safe spaces, microaggression, and trigger are code words justifying censorship. Multisyllabic terms are invented to whitewash the suppression of speech by covering them with a veneer of pseudo-intellectualism. This intolerance for certain ideas is found across many subjects, though with one disturbing common denominator. Political speech supporting President Trump is disfavored. 
Immigration speech on securing our borders is disfavored. Speech supporting America's greatest ally in the Middle East, the nation of Israel, is disfavored, especially speech on Jerusalem or Israel maintaining defensible borders. There's even a boycott movement actively being promoted against uh, uh, Israel on Americans' campuses today in an attempt to delegitimize Israel. The America's Christian community is a great friend to Israel, and speaking of Christians, no beliefs are under greater assault on secular campuses. I refer to Orthodox Christian beliefs in whatever tradition, carrying out the great commission to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, speaking biblical truths on the issue of the day, and believing the Bible to be or contain the word of God. Opposition to these views often forbids even mild expressions of belief. The Capitol's uh, painting on the baptism of Pocahontas, the portrait of Jesus hanging outside the Great Hall in the Justice Department, these works of art would not be welcome on many modern campuses. The cons common denominator here is that such conservative speech does not comport with the prevailing ideology of some campuses. People of faith, whether evangelical, Catholic, Jewish, or other faith, have a civil right under the First Amendment to share their faith and viewpoint on public campuses. And the university abridging those violates their civil rights and could be investigated by the Justice Department. My additional remarks are included in addition to uh, other topics that this committee could be explored in my written testimony. Thank you again. Uh, Chair, thanks the witnesses for your testimony and I'll now recognize myself uh, for my um, five minutes questioning period. And I would, um, I would turn first to Mr. Kurtz, whom I happen to know to be an historian, and uh, would ask you if, um, if you're aware of what our founding fathers thought about the limitations of free speech that uh, as they watched the Greek city-states and how they handled free speech there, have you had any study on that topic? Demagogues. Well, uh, I ha uh, the founders, I think, were concerned that uh, the classical world as a whole, both the Greek city-states and the Romans, had a kind of democracy and yet lost it. Uh, and this example was always in their mind. Uh, there was a question when, uh, when the uh, founders began as to whether a viable democracy was even possible. So yes, they were very concerned about whether uh, uh, freedom uh, was sustainable and the Constitution was a, ki a kind of structural attempt to solve that problem and of course the Bill of Rights as well. Thank you, Mr. Kurtzman. Are you familiar with, um, just uh, have you taken a look on balance? Is there, are there any countries in the world that protect freedom of speech the way we do here in the United States? No, I really don't think there, there are any comparable examples, and the examples you gave at the beginning of Europe are very telling. And I would uh, note that the attack on uh, freedom of speech on campuses is often framed in terms of civility. But in my view, freedom of speech is the ultimate act of civility. It is an exercise in the teaching of civility. I go back to Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, who said the key test of free speech is not tolerating uh, ideas that agree with you, but freedom for the thought that you hate. So think about that. Free speech means that we have to tolerate something that we hate. We have to hold ourselves back from attacking them, physically attacking them, or trying to snuff them out. That is actually, we call it freedom, and it is, but freedom is an inherently an exercise in self-restraint. And I believe that it's precisely because of America's unique tradition of liberty that we've had greater civil peace on the whole than Europe, where they don't have those protections. The Civil War is the exception that proves the rule. That happened because we violated freedom in a very important case. But on the whole, freedom of speech actually produces civility, and this is what I think people on campus need to learn. Thank you, Mr. Kurtz, and I'd point out from a historical perspective, our founding fathers were very well aware that in the Greek city-states, if a demagogue became too effective with his freedom of speech, he was banished from the city-state for seven years. Presumably he got over it and he could come back again. Uh, the founding fathers didn't opt into anything of that nature. They decided instead, let's have this competition of freedom of speech, let the ideas compete, let the good ideas surface, and the bad ideas would be treated with the level of disrespect that they deserved. I, I would turn to Mr. Klukowski and ask, uh, 
uh, on college campuses, um, what's your recommendation? Um, uh, the, the private schools, should they be allowed to uh, um, focus a, a, as much as they choose on their particular religions, whether it's Christianity or Judaism or, or uh, any other religious group? Uh, two recommendations, Mr. Chairman. First of all, regarding private uh, institutions, Congress does have authority under the spending clause to condition eligibility for federal funding on private universities respecting speech in such a manner that if they were to suppress speech in a way that would be a civil rights violation, actionable by the Justice Department if done by a public university, that could be a trigger, to use the word appropriately, for reducing or eliminating certain types of federal funding. The amount of federal funds that Ivy League universities are now receiving is so astounding that in just a few years, they would be in a financial position where all of their students could attend for free if they would allow that to go. So I believe that's something that would really get their attention. The second is, and this is very disturbing, the increasing difficulty that individuals and groups have at getting quality legal representation. There are major corporations who are severing their ties with law firms that are taking on religious liberty and conservative speech issues, uh, whether paid or pro bono. Okay, and I believe that the committee could also look at how to ensure that access to the courthouse remains open for these groups, including Thank you, those Mr. Kowski, on campus. But uh, you wouldn't assert th th then that freedom, you know, robust freedom of speech, even in, in promoting a particular religion on a private campus, is any kind of constitutional violation. It just might be to the discretion of Congress to limit their funding. Well, and in fact, for faith-based uh, organizations, such as Liberty University, where I once taught on faculty, or Notre Dame, where I received my undergraduate degree, or Brigham Young, where I've been a guest lecturer, at any religious mission private university, they enjoy additional protections, not just free speech, but also free exercise and even establishment. And so I believe those faith-based institutions could Thank enjoy you, protections. Thank I want to quickly ask Mr. Hudson, um, with regard to this topic we have in front of us, is the truth a factor at at all? Uh, or are we free to speak uh, freely, true or not? Is that even a judgment that should enter into this discussion, Mr. Hudson? Well, I think I'd go back to John Milton and Areopagitica. All right, let truth and falsehood grapple, whoever knew truth put to the worse in a free and open encounter. We hope that true ideas will trump negative ideas, and certainly truth is important if there's an allegation of defamation, because truth and the substantial truth defense is important if somebody is accused of defamation. But we want to have competing ideas because it's through competing ideas that we as a society come to recognize what we consider to be the greater truth at that time. Agreed, Mr. Hudson. Thanks for your response. And the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Tennessee, the ranking member, uh, Mr. Cohen. Thank you. Uh, are we on here? I guess we are. Thank the panelists, very distinguished group of panelists and uh, wonderful testimony. Uh, Mr. Hudson, I couldn't even see your teleprompter. You did such a good job of <laughs> bring that. You're, you're amazed at your, your memory of the, of the cases, the verbiage, and the citations. Uh, credit to Vanderbilt. Dynamite, dynamite, when Vandy starts to fight. Um, I, I agree. <laughs> the <doors. laughs> the uh, Congress has a program where they encourage students to submit artwork to be chosen from each congressional district to be displayed in a hallway between the Capitol and uh, House office building. One of those paintings submitted by Lacey Clay of Missouri was by a student in his district that showed police and citizens in Ferguson, Missouri, and it was a painting that didn't show necessarily policemen in the best light. Uh, quite a few people objected to it, and it was taken off the halls, even though chosen by S Representative Clay, and it's not hanging any longer. I'd like to know what each of you think about that practice of the Congress taking down a painting chosen by a member without any previous policy concerning content and censoring the publication. Mr. Kurtz, would you go first? As you describe it, Congressman Cohen, I would not want to take down the painting, but I, while I don't recall the details, as I understand it, 
part of that dispute had something to do with rules. Apparently there were some sort of rules about what sort of painting could be up there to begin with and there was an allegation that the painting violated the fundamental rules of the contest. I, I really can't comment finally on the controversy because I'd have to study that aspect. As you, as you present it, it sounds like the painting should have been left up, but I'm, uh, I have the proviso that there are further elements of the controversy that need to be studied regarding those rules and perhaps other things as well before I can give a final opinion. The rules had never been enforced before and the rules were fairly vague about political controversies. Uh, and that's all in the mind of the beholder, I guess. Just is it Lukanov? L Lukianov. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, FIRE restricts its work to uh, issues surrounding higher education, and it's actually a very uh, deep field. So we don't have a particular opinion on that. However, um, we do work uh, routinely with the, national, the Great National Coalition Against Censorship, and I know that they wrote a letter objecting to this as a form of viewpoint discrimination that was, if not uh, unconstitutional, inappropriate. Um, and we definitely defer to the, to the NCAC on that. Thank you. Mr. Hudson? It sounds like content discrimination, perhaps even viewpoint discrimination. If I was representing the student, I'd try to analogize to the Barbara Papish case, which I believe was slide one of, yes. of Mr. Lukanoff's presentation in August of 2015, where the individual uh, wrote a, a graduate student wrote an article that was uh, depicted the police uh, very negatively um, with a negative uh, action toward the Statute of Liberty. Um, I understand that there may be different rules, as Mr. Kurtz has said, and so I'd have to study that further, but uh, on first glance, it does sound like content discrimination. What would the rules have to be to be constitutionally valid? I mean, you just can't have a rule, there shall be no painting that pictures the police in a bad uh, perspective. How, how would you have a rule that could limit content and be spe specific enough to give uh, notice to the artist? That's a very good question. I think it would have to be extremely narrowly drafted. I think you'd have to have notice and you'd have to have no problem of selective enforcement. You may be able to argue uh, the government speech doctrine if you're on the government side and argue that it has not been opened up as a true public forum or limited public forum. Um, but again, I tend to take the First Amendment side of it. I think it, it sounds like content discrimination to me. Thank you, sir. Mr. Klukowski? Uh, Congressman, I think there's a, a two-part way to answer that, and I, too, would have to study it further. First, as, as my colleague just said, the first question is whether this is, in fact, private speech and whether this is any type of public forum. If it's a limited public forum, content-based uh, uh, restrictions are permissible to keep the forum consistent with the purposes for which the public has access to it. If it's a non-public forum, any reasonable restrictions would be permitted. Now, if it's viewpoint-based instead of content-based, content then it would be unconstitutional under either of those. However, there is an entire line of Supreme Court first spe uh, free speech jurisprudence regarding government speech versus private speech. The protections we're referring to are for private speakers engaging in protected speech. If this is, in fact, the government subsidizing or providing a platform to associate itself with speech, the government does not need to associate itself with speech with which it disagrees. And I think the question there would be whether or not that depiction would then be associated as the expression of Congress. Thank you, I appreciate each of you, and I think you've shown well that this issue and the issue of the First Amendment and art and censorship is much like healthcare. It's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen's time has expired, and the chair would now recognize the vice chairman of this subcommittee, Mr. DeSantis of Florida. Mr. DeSantis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Lushinoff, um, part of the things that I've noticed about this debate is that there seems to be a declining support for First Amendment values amongst younger people. And so we deal with the issues that you guys ably deal with because we want free expression on the campus. That's just a good thing. But it seems to me the result of some of these uh, codes and restrictions has been that's kind of 
what people are now socialized to, or maybe they're Absolutely even advocating are. it. So can you speak to the issue of the extent to which younger people have really walked away from core First Amendment values and are actually supportive of having a lot of these restrictions? Uh, absolutely, and, and it's absolutely, that's the thing that keeps me up at night right now. Um, so I've been doing this since 2001, and for the overwhelming majority of my career, the people that were on the, in my opinion, wrong side of freedom of speech were campus administrators. Sometimes faculty were pro-speech code. The single best constituency on campuses were always the students themselves, often poor and minority students, often non traditional age students have, where I've been are some of our best allies. I don't know precisely what happened, but somewhere around 2013, 2014, we started seeing a shift to students demanding freedom of speech for themselves, understanding that it was really important for them to have that, to uh, what I dubbed freedom from speech that, that, that they dislike. And this is the most distressing cultural change I've seen in my career. But that means what we have to do, we have to think about ways of getting not just the law, not just, uh, not, not just um, uh, the First Amendment in front of them, but we have to get the philosophy of freedom of speech uh, in front of more students. I think it's crucial for students to know, for example, the incredibly important role that freedom of speech played in the gay rights movement, in the civil rights movement, in all of American history. Um, when, uh, when it was recognized, it has been a force for, for innovation and, and progress. But I think students are primarily taught uh, that freedom of speech is the argument of the bully, the bigot, and the robber baron, and that's completely inappropriate. So I think I'm constantly thinking of ways to get in front of people at a younger age. I was even to to toying with the idea of writing a children's book about freedom of speech, but we have to be creative in teaching this as a profound uh, philosophy uh, that helps protect deep pluralism in our society. Yeah, Mr. Kurtz, I think you get at this a little bit. I mean, if you look at like the Yale situation that happened, I mean, you have the Woodward reports, the standard, clearly, you know, they've walked very far away from that. Um, but as you watch those videos, it seemed to me that that was really led by the students, some of these really radical students, and that the administration more caved rather than stand up for the values of the Woodward report. Um, and, and I think that may track with your view about, you know, they're not really holding some of these people accountable. So can you address that? Yes, uh, Congressman DeSantis, uh, as I emphasized in my remarks, I think the administrator's caving is very much at the heart of the problem, although it's absolutely true that we have a generational difficulty now, and uh, Greg Lukianoff has uh, discussed that both in his writings and today uh, very well. Uh, and so I think we have to intervene in this sector now, and you mentioned the Woodward Report. The Woodward Report was published in 1974, and it gave a history of a series of attacks on free speech that occur had occurred at Yale going back to 1963. These were pretty much attacks uh, from the left against the right. The problematic pattern, the McCarthyism of the 50s was a very big problem, but as, uh, beginning in the early 60s, the problem went the other way. So we have to realize this problem on campus has been going on for more than five decades and it's getting worse now, and administrators are still caving. That's why I've suggested legislative intervention at both the state and the federal level. Ordinarily, you try to take a hands-off posture and see if a sector could right itself. But what's happened now is that for literally five and a half decades, the problem has been getting worse. I think legislators, ultimately, their first responsibility is to protect the rights of their constituents. So I think it's time to intervene. Well, we, I mean, we're sending a lot of money. I mean, so that's where really why we have a role. If we weren't funding anything, then I would just say we just stay out of it. But if we're going to be subsidizing this type, these types of, um, of forums that are not uh, free speech, um, infused with free speech values, then it, it becomes an issue. Uh, Mr. Klukowski, uh, you mentioned you know, some of the drowning out of pro-Israel voices in college campuses. It's very concerning to me. Um, is that something that's relatively recent, um, or has this been a long-running problem? The BDS movement is is a, a more recent phenomenon. I mean, th there's been different types of disfavored views on campuses, of course, going back countless decades. But what you see here is is the Israel and America's conservative Christian community married as close cousins in terms of the sort of disfavor that they, that they see for their viewpoints and their values. 
Uh, I don't know if one is a proxy for the other or what precisely the connection there is, but, but it tends to be the same students who both try to express biblical beliefs or other observant conservative Christian beliefs who are also outspoken supporters uh, of the nation of Israel. A and we see between the two of those, we see a multi-pronged uh, opposition taking all of these various forms. Great, it was a good, good panel, you guys did a good job. I and mean, I would just say, I would echo my colleague on the other side about you know, trying to drown out speech by just yelling people down. I mean, be passionate, make your voice heard, but these speakers that come to campus should be heard. Defeat them with the ideas. If you don't like them, make good counter arguments, but don't just scream so they can't get their point across, and I yield back. The gentleman returns this time, and uh, the chair will now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, the venerable gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Conyers. Uh, venerable is not a... Well, I don't know if it's appropriate or not. <laughs> let, let me say, uh, Chairman King, that uh, you have demonstrated a uh, very open and fair examination of this whole question of uh, First Amendment protections uh, yourself, and I, uh, I wanted to compliment you on it. I, I think this discussion with these distinguished witnesses would pass muster at an American Civil Liberties Union <laughs> <laughs> meeting itself. <laughs> and uh, I, I uh, sincerely congratulate you on it, and the witnesses have been very provocative. Uh, to David Hudson, I'd like to ask, wouldn't requiring colleges to punish students, possibly with expulsion, for shouting down offensive speakers itself violate student free speech rights? What do you think of that, sir? It could be. It'd have to be analyzed on a case-by-case -case basis. Correct. I do think that you'd have to have a clear standard of something akin to substantial disruption. If a student does intentionally and substantially disrupt a school function, um, then that is thwarting freedom of speech and that is disallowing uh, invited speakers. Uh, as far as expulsion, that, that seems like a drastic remedy to me. I, I think that there certainly could be punishments far less severe and I would hope it would be an opportunity for the university to have a teaching moment. Um, you know. I believe fully in the counter speech doctrine, and I mentioned Justice Brandeis, more speech, not enforced silence. The very next sentence, I believe, in his opinion is, only an emergency can justify repression. So in emergency circumstances, I certainly believe that a university can take the steps that it needs to to ensure that there is order and that the invited speaker can speak. Um, anytime you have punishment for a, a student for speaking out, I think there has to be clearly delineated standards or we run afoul of due process concerns. And the last thing we would want to do is to have a zero tolerance mentality that is infecting many K through 12 school districts and superimpose that on the college and university level. Thank you so much. Uh Continuing our discussion, some have argued that hate speech is not merely a symptom merely of underlying bigotry, but also a cause of such bigotry, and that hateful speech and images can create social realities that put minorities and women at risk, thus justifying limits on such speech. How do you figure that kind of situation into our <coughs> examination of this important subject? Well, I generally think that speech should be protected. Um, in our free society, hate speech is protected unless it incites imminent lawless action, unless it crosses the line into a true threat, or it constitutes fighting words. Now, on a college and university campus, I would support a well-drafted, narrowly tailored anti-harassment code. 
that deals with direct face-to-face -face harassment and vilification. That has to be addressed. We cannot ignore racism in this country, and we cannot ignore racism on public and, uh, college and university campuses because that could deny somebody the opportunity to attend uh, uh, and, and have an, a free educational environment. But that does need to be severe and pervasive harassment, as Mr. Lukianoff has, has said in his, written, in his stated and written testimony. Severe and pervasive harassment is a recognized standard in employment discrimination law. And I certainly think, the, certainly the U.S. Supreme Court used it in Davis v. Monroe. So I think when we have an anti-harassment code, it has to be narrowly tailored, and it has to deal with direct face-to-face -face vilification. Thank you, sir. Now, my last question is to uh, Greg Lukanoff. Uh, if a harassment policy model on the Title IX standard uh, would pass m constitutional muster, why haven't more colleges and universities, particularly public ones, adopted uh, a, uh, uh, it's severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive requirements? Uh, that, that's a terrific question, um, and, and, it's, uh, uh, and the answer is that um, uh, the first thing is that they uh, believe falsely that by having a more expansive definition of harassment, th uh, or for that matter, for having speech zones, for example, that they're protecting themselves from legal liability. Um, and this is a fear that's fed into by what's known as the risk management industry, which have consultants which more or less say, you know, d definitely you know, cover, your, uh, cover yourselves. <laughs> um, and this is made worse by the growth, growth in bureaucracy on campus. Um, so you have full-time employees who are trying to figure out ways to regulate every aspect of student life, and they do, uh, they over-regulate. Um, uh, political correctness, of course, is real. So there are people who actually are, do want to protect people's feelings. But there's also ignorance of the law is a problem. So you, uh, FIRE works closely with it, administrators all the time, trying to make sure they understand, again, both the law and philosophy behind it. Um, and unfortunately, the fifth uh, factor that's new is that students seem to be demanding, some relatively small number of students nonetheless, but seem to be demanding these new codes. So when we talk about um, the, the changing university codes to uh, reflect the actual federal Davis standard that we recommend, um, we're, we're saying, first of all, um, the code you have is going to get you sued eventually, and you're going to lose in court. Uh, the, the definition that we propose comes directly from the Supreme Court. It's never going to be overturned, and it does actually deal uh, with cases of serious, uh, serious harassment. Now, the, tri the one last thing is, the trick, though, is to tell universities that it should be uh, no less or no more than Davis, because the heartbreaking thing, looking at these policies sometimes, is you'll see a perfectly constitutional harassment policy in one section, and then the other section, they say things like inappropriately directed laughter. Thank you, sir, and I thank all the witnesses, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The humble and gentle, and, and, and the humble gentleman and venerable gentleman from Michigan has returned his time, and uh, now the chair would recognize use that the word again. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the chair would now recognize uh, the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Franks, for five minutes, Mr. Franks. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to uh, congratulate you on uh, having this hearing on such a profoundly significant and important issue. Um, I consider freedom of religion and freedom of expression to be the cornerstone of all other freedoms. And uh, I've heard uh, tremendous uh, uh, comments here today. It gives me hope. Uh, Mr. Hudson, I think you're the minority witness here, and yet I've heard a lot of things that uh, comport with what I hear from the rest of the witnesses here, and sir, I don't think you're ever going to need a microphone in your class. <laughs> um, but I was uh, really astonished at your, your ability to call these things from memory, and I assume that's probably partly because you teach this in class on a number of occasions. But it gives me hope to see that uh, among thinking and uh, uh, studious individuals that there is a large uh, commonality here. And, and religious uh, and uh, just free speech in general uh, because I am convinced that truth and time do indeed travel on the same road and if truth is given a chance it will prevail over fallacy 
Um, so again, I just congratulate everyone. Uh, Mr. Kurtz, your quiet scholarship is stunning. And Mr. Lukinoff, I, I think you're going to be at the forefront of a lot of good things that are going to happen. I've already addressed Mr. Hudson, Hudson and Mr. Klukowski has been a friend of mine for 25 years or more. And I, I, I shouldn't say that publicly because it'll completely undermine his testimony. <laughs> but uh, I think he, he's presented himself tremendously well today. So I'm going to you know, remind us all that Abraham Lincoln said that to not deny freedom to others, uh, you know, it, 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 those who deny freedom to others deserve it not for themselves, nor under a just God can they long retain it. And um, one of the great concerns I have are these campus shoutdowns, and I see that in the political uh, arena a great deal now, where there's not a discussion, uh, where there's just simply a bullhorn that just drowns everyone out. And to me, that's the antithesis of free speech. And I appreciate how it has been very forthrightly uh, addressed by all of you. So, Mr. Lukianoff, I was just going to give you another chance to, to kind of give us an update on how prevalent speech uh, zone policies in the nation's public uh, colleges and universities are. And, and what do you think uh, is their rationale for quarantining free speech <laughs> to one spe specific area? Oh, my. Well, um, they've been decreasing. Speech zone policies have been, you know, I said there's been about 60 lawsuits um, against uh, speech codes, and an awful lot of those have been against speech zones. So they're about, I think, about one-fifth of the colleges we survey now maintain speech zones. But if it's okay to talk about the shutdowns for, for, for a second, um, I'm working on a, on a book right now, and I have to spend a lot of time watching some of the recent um, situation, for, for example, at UC Berkeley um, when, the, when the riots broke out. And the thing that scared me the most about that was that they, it wasn't just sh merely shouting someone down, it was actually responding with violence. Yeah. Uh, people were hit in the face with flagpoles, people were maced, people were struck, there was pools of blood that, that, that the protesters were trying to clean up. And I felt genuinely scared watching that because um, they were very lucky that nobody got killed. And when we start actually making the transition from merely, uh, shouting down is surely bad enough, but when it becomes we have to do more, we have to physically attack these people, we've entered a, 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 a situation that makes me genuinely quite scared. Well, I couldn't agree with you more, and I think it kind of falls on us. When we allow people to be shouted down, right. if we don't draw the line there, then we invite uh, what follows it. As for an example where people absolutely should have been arrested, what, what, what happened at Berkeley? Um, you know, by not doing that, they, they encourage bad behavior in the future. I agree. Uh, Mr. Kuklowski, I'm, I'm troubled by the double standard that colleges seem to be applying when they let fraternities choose their leaders and members based on sex, but refuse to let the religious groups choose their leaders based on religious beliefs. And it, you know, I think it's great for colleges to allow fraternities and to choose their leaders and members as they always have done, but why not allow the religious groups to do the same? Why, why, why the double standard? Well, it, it's disturbing, and there is a recent Supreme Court case, uh, Christian Legal Society versus Martinez. It was a 5-4 decision. I, I respectfully believe that the court decided that wrongly. Uh, where you had uh, the Christian Legal Society just said, if you wanted to be an officer of the club, then you needed to adhere to certain religious views and conduct consistent with those religious views. And in that case, it was on the matter of sexuality. And it's no surprise to anyone on this committee that, uh, that there is a robust debate going on in the country on matters of marriage and sexuality and gender. Uh, and in, in, a, in a regard, it's just uh, an evolution of a debate that's been going on for decades on, on abortion. And, and that becomes for individuals who have certain views that are derived from millennia old religious beliefs. Are they allowed to express those, both in terms of their written and spoken words, and are they also allowed to organize themselves uh, according to those principles? And, and I think there's been a very disturbing trend in the law in that regard, and I hope the Supreme Court now moves more in the direction of the original meaning of the relevant provisions of the First Amendment and restore these safeguards for people of faith. Well, Mr. Chairman, that is certainly the Supreme Court's job to consider the original intent. I thank you for this, and I guess I'm just reminded from all of us that uh, true tolerance is not pretending you have no differences. It's being kind and decent to each, to each other in spite of those differences. Thank you, sir. The gentleman returns his time, and Chair would now recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Nadler. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm glad Mr. Uh, Franks just went before me because he raised a subject that I want to pursue for a moment with Mr. Kulikowski. Uh, Klukowski? Klukowski. Um, I would think that a college religious society, the Christian society of whatever college, should be allowed to limit its uh, officers to believing Christians. 
what I want to ask is, you, you made a thing about, you, you, know, thing. you, you made a statement about uh, uh, controversies. Now, I can understand if the Christian society uh, wanted to say that uh, only someone who believed, or the Catholic society of so-and-so college wanted to limit its officers or its membership for that matter only to people who believe that abortion was uh, immoral, they should be able to do that. On the other hand, if they wanted to, limit, to, to bar people who said, well, I believe as a practicing Catholic that abortion is immoral, but I also believe that I shouldn't impose my views through government and I disagree politically with government uh, opposing abortion, should that be allowed too, or is that going beyond the religious and, and uh, the religious uh, requirement? Well, and I think that's not necessarily just exclusive to religion. For example, if you had an, uh, an NRA club on campus and you had a gun control advocate who wanted to be an officer and then to try to start creating policy for the organization who says, I support the Second Amendment, but I believe in what I consider reasonable restrictions, such as saying no one can have a handgun no, 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 in their no, home. No, that's, that, that, that's a, a wrong analogy. Someone who agrees with the Catholic Church's position on abortion 100%, it's immoral, it's horrible, etc., but disagrees that the, the, uh, about government policy. I, I believe it's the same, Congressman, because this is someone who can say, I personally think everyone should own these things, but I don't believe I should impose those rules on government that they have to have laws that respect those things. I think the two are inseparable, a person's faith and their religious so you beliefs. Think, so you think that the, the, the society should be able to bar as officers and members both groups of people? I believe it is the role of the faith-based organization and not the government, which the university administration is right, the I government, to, to impose that, that requirement yeah, on them. Clarify, I want to clarify. Now let's get back to the subject of the hearing. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, and, and let me say, I feel very strongly about these issues and personally about these issues of being shouted down. When I was an undergraduate at Columbia, I was very deliberately shouted down uh, at a political meeting and prevented from expressing my view as soon as a certain faction got a whiff of what they thought my view might be, and I wasn't the only person at that meeting. Um, and I, I remember what it felt like, and I'm, I'm very much opposed to that. Uh, first, uh, uh, Mr. Hudson, and please answer briefly because I have a number of questions. Do you believe the Garcetti decision has created confusion in the lower courts over whether there's an academic exception from the general rule that a public employee's speech made pursuant to official duties is not protected under the First Amendment? And have we seen public university professors punished under Garcetti and specifically under the K-12 rules of Garcetti? Yes, there's a split in the circuits. The Fourth Circuit in the Adams decision and the Ninth Circuit in the Deemers decision has said Garcetti does not apply in the academic context when we're talking about scholarship. Okay, uh, Mr. Hudson and Mr. Lukian. Uh, no. mm -hmm. The Campus Anti-Harassment Act proposed by FIRE defines actionable harassment in part as I said, in part as part of a pattern of targeted unwelcome conduct. Mm -hmm. Could a single incident, if it is sufficiently severe and objectively offensive, also constitute harassment as would be the case under employment discrimination law? Uh, generally, it, it would be a pattern of behavior. Um, it would have to be something that actually becomes no, more, more, more uh, behavioral. Sorry. Uh, that's it depends on how egregious the act is. Generally, it needs to be repetitious. If the act is egregious enough, at least in employment discrimination law, it could rise to the level of severe and pervasive. And by, and by the way, generally things that are egregious enough are unprotected speech for other reasons. Threats uh, would not be protected, for example, because it's already unprotected speech. Now, Mr. Kurtz and Mr. Kukowski, uh, are you concerned that any federal legislation that would penalize a state college or university by withholding federal student aid or other educational funds for refusing to implement the federally mandated speech disciplinary system or for failing to abide by a pledge to uphold religious liberty as defined by a congressional statute might run afoul of constitutional limitations placed on the spending clause? In other words, it's beyond our ability to do that under our spending clause power. You're referring, Congressman, to the coercion doctrine under the 10th Amendment. Uh, to date, there's only- Part of it. Uh, to date, there's only been one uh, case where it's been held that the amount, that, the, that the, um, the dollar amount that was on the table actually coerced the states to such a degree that they did not have a meaningful it's choice. Not the, it's not just the coercion. It's we claim, we have to have a, uh, a constitutional basis for anything we do. Yes. Um, if we were to pass such legislation, penalizing a state college university for the reasons stated, would that be within our power 
to do such a thing because we give them money under the spending clause. Under United States versus Butler, 1936, it would be. The Supreme Court was divided on that issue. Hamilton's view would be, I'm sorry, Madison's view would be that that would have been unconstitutional, but Hamilton's view defeated Madison's there, and the court interpreted a very broad mandate for spending power that would authorize that sort of restriction. Well, there are already uh, something called program participation agreements that colleges and universities sign that have quite a number of requirements when they receive federal money. And of course, under Title IX of the Higher Education Amendments, I actually think that enforcement through um, uh, guidance from the Secretary has gone too far, but we've got a precedent of, of a tremendous amount of uh, federal in involvement in, in fine-toothed issues in universities, so I would be surprised if, if uh, fundamental protection for freedom of speech would run afoul uh, of that provision. Thank you, and let me thank the chairman for letting me go over time. The gentleman returns his time, and the chair would now recognize the gentleman from the first district of Texas, Mr. Gomer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for having this hearing, because it really is critical. Uh, you were all asked to speculate without the rules being before you about the Congressional Art Contest. So let me read you the rule that every contestant had to read and sign saying they understood the rules. Uh, in part it says, exhibits depicting subjects of contemporary political controversy or a sensationalistic or gruesome nature are not allowed. Any portion not in consonance with the commission's policy will be omitted from the exhibit. If an entrant is unsure about whether a piece of art is acceptable, he or she should contact the staff or his or her member of Congress, and then the congressional staff can speak with personnel who can determine where the artwork would be acceptable. So only if you believe contemporary political controversy is vague and unreasonable or arbitrary and capricious would one say depicting our nation's law enforcement officers who risk their lives to save ours every day, um, tr depicting them as dogs, that uh, that would not be uh, political controversy. So I never removed the painting. I felt like that should be left for those in authority who would make the decision. It was not my decision. But um, I guess this points to the problem we have in Washington where members of Congress cannot discern whether or not depicting our law enforcement um, who are heroes somewhere in America every day, depicting them as dogs, pigs, whatever, that that's, that's not controversial, that's a good thing. Um, I, I, um, it's amazing. Yet at the same time, um, toward the end of last year, we had an Israeli uh, writer, fantastic writer, Carolyn Glick, writes for the Jerusalem Post, She's written a book uh, regarding a one-state solution, and she was invited to speak at the University of Texas in Austin. Uh, apparently, from what I've been uh, provided, uh, the J Street group that's considered the more moderate, more liberal, some would say self-loathing self uh, of uh, Jewish Patriots, uh, patriotic to Israel, uh, but apparently they also are involved in APAC, so it was um, a allegedly pro-Israeli group that put pressure to have her disinvited. Uh, another group stepped in and pressure was brought to bear against them not to have such a controversial um, author and writer, and uh, ultimately uh, she was disinvited, although a rabbi offered to let her speak in his home when pressure was brought to bear by him trying to have her come to the public institution. As I, I attended Texas A&M, it was one of the most conservative public institutions when I attended, 
we were proud to have very liberal people there. I was helping host uh, Ralph Nader, and I love the exchange, but what deeply bothers me about Texas A&M and uh, so many, most all colleges, with just a very few exceptions, it's as if they're afraid to debate a conservative position. Um, so let me ask what you see as the biggest danger in our college campuses and how would you recommend we specifically take steps to stop it or prevent it? Just very quickly, I know you gave statements and you're dealing with this issue, but I'd like to get down to a nutshell very quickly. Sure, uh, uh, Congressman Gomert. As I said in my uh, testimony, I think the shutdowns are really fundamental at this point. Uh, they're spectacular. The news travels across the country through media of all kinds, and so they have a kind of contagious effect. And that's why I think the state and federal legislative proposals I mentioned are necessary, at least in some form, and that they've got to include something about the shout-downs. But if it's just the shout-downs, couldn't that be the local authorities just make sure there are no shout-downs or usher them out? Well, unfortunately, the local authorities, who are the university administrators or the police that they choose to call or not to call <laughs> in, aren't doing anything. That is the real problem is that the administrators who ought to be enforcing the First Amendment on their public college and university campuses really aren't doing that. And this has been, and this has so been going like on for George decades. So it's like George Wallace refusing to follow the Constitution required federal action until people started following it, correct? Mr. Lukanoff, would, would you agree or? Well, it's a, it's a, big, uh, a big grand question. I wanted to give sort of bigger uh, an, an answers to it on what, what can be done. Now, the most important thing that Congress can do is help fix the uh, legal incentives that actually make it um, easier for uh, university general counsels to justify speech codes, to justify erring on the side of censorship rather than free speech. And there's a lot I think Congress can do about that. But there's d deeper things that we need to do, which I mentioned before, which is teach philosophy of freedom of speech earlier, um, create the right expectations to students when they come into school. Stu students should be, be taught when they come into, and University of Chicago, for example, does a very good job of this, saying, we believe in freedom of speech, it's, just, it, it's just, you know, an incredible vision, but that also includes that you do not have the right to shout down a speaker, you do not, and you certainly don't have the right to respond uh, violently. And then we have to, probably the, the subtlest thing, but that we desperately need to do as a society, is we have to habituate people to listening to each other across lines of differences. Um, that's something that uh, institutions like higher education could actually be helping with. But I think what we're actually doing is we're, we're encouraging people to talk inside their echo chambers instead of talk across lines of difference. Okay. Ms. Johnson. Limit Garcetti legislatively as applied in the academic and university context provide protection for student, enhanced protections for student journalists, and not allow the importation of standards from K through 12. Educate young people with civic education and give them an opportunity to live in an environment where they appreciate a constitutional democracy, and continue the work of groups like FIRE that limit uh, overbroad free speech zones and overbroad and vague uh, anti-harassment policies. Mr. Klukowski. First, thank you for sharing the rules regarding the pictures. And <laughs> on, on that basis, I would say I believe it is a viewpoint neutral content based restriction which would survive either under a limited public forum analysis or that it could be associated as governmental speech. Uh, regarding university campuses, uh, once again, you're, you're touching in your example on a subject matter which I've noted is singularly disfavored. And in that regard, again, I do believe there is spending clause legislation that can be used to encourage private universities to act like public universities. I believe that the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division could start investigating public universities where they are engaging in censorship of speech. And finally, the, the Congress needs to consider what can be done to help protect the ability of individuals and groups to be able to get lawyers, whether paid or pro bono, because again, there is an increasing boycott movement right now that if you take on certain cases, there are major corporations that are subject to Congress's Commerce Clause power that will drop you as a law firm. Thank you, and Mr. Chairman, thanks 
for letting them each answer, though my question went right up the time. And if I might inquire, I was trying to remember, was George Wallace a Republican, do you recall? I don't recall that he was ever a Republican, Mr. He's Gilbert. always a Democrat, okay. <laughs> and I, and I, I thank you for your inquiry. I, I would point out as we conclude this hearing that at the last straw poll in Ames, I had an individual come from behind me, reach around and grab my microphone and try to, try to scream and yell and speak into my microphone. I didn't see him coming. I wrestled the microphone out of his hands, back into <laughs> mine, and I said, get your own microphone. <laughs> uh, so I think that's a relevant narrative to conclude today's hearing, and I want to thank all the witnesses, not only for your testimony, but for your response to the questions, and thank the panelists for your participation and the staff. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witnesses or additional materials for the record. This hearing is now adjourned.